Today is August the 20th. I'm in the capital city of Alberta. I'm in Edmonton. I'm joined uh, by Mr. Raj Sharma. He's an immigration lawyer in Calgary. And before I get started on why I have invited Mr. Sharma to talk to me about a certain, of course, obviously, an immigration viewpoint on certain things happening in the industry, uh, I want to introduce who is Raj Sharma, what does he do, and uh, why is he very relevant and important to our discussion today. So Raj Sharma is uh, acclaimed. All you have to do is just type his name on Google and you'll see his bio and his company name and stuff. I won't go there. But what I like about Raj Sharma is that uh, I, I read a little uh, bio about him on, on uh, you know, different websites. Uh, but as you know that I read uh, uh, court cases, especially immigration cases on Canly all the time. So if I am looking to read about misrepresentation or Section 40 or 179 or LMIE exempt or maybe, uh, you know, removal defense or something. Uh, when I type those keywords, I often find Raj Sharma as in the search, search uh, you know, on the Canly so I can see his uh, results, how many cases he has uh, taken and many of his cases are successful. Uh, so let's let's jump in uh, about Raj Sharma. So I, I can show you on the screen, if you may, uh, and I'm reading from his, uh, from his website. Uh, Raj Sharma was, uh, he's not like me, he was born here in Canada. Uh, he did his uh, JD from University of Alberta uh, in the Edmonton where I am. And after collecting with Alberta Court of Appeal, he completed his articles with Federal Department of Justice. And later on, he worked for two years Immigration Refugee Board, where many of those, uh, you know, refugee applicants, uh, you know, wind up in, in different stages of case hearing. So he he has good experience of dealing uh, with with the refugee determination at that at that stage. He also did his LLM from Osgood uh, Osgood uh, Hall, which is which is one of the reputed uh, law schools in Canada. And uh, I was also struck by his uh, what is written on his bio is research paper in support dealing with the dif reference to immigration refugee adjudication in Canada. Now. Anybody can do, do uh, you know, anybody means like licensed consultants can do immigration applications like temporary application, permanent applications and other, other uh, HNC and stuff. But uh, once the application uh, is delayed or blocked due to some mistakes or maybe they are looking to investigate your background or if they're looking to, you know, maybe, uh, you know, challenge you on something that you said or did not say and uh, it, it ends up possibly in judicial review or at the worst, maybe a full cancellation. And that's the time you need a lawyer to represent you in a federal court. Uh, and that is where Raj Sharma comes into the picture. Raj Sharma has, is a claimed practitioner of adjudication in federal court. Uh, and that's why I have invited uh, him here. Raj, uh, welcome to my show. And I'm very glad, I'm excited. And I don't say this very lightly. I'm really excited to have you, uh, you know, here and given us time out of, I know you are swamped, uh, you have a number of applications you do in federal court, and you had time to talk to me about uh, certain application today. I agree. Sure. Uh, I'm a fan of you as well, and uh, I'm just uh, really happy to hang out with you today. So, uh, and, and I hope one day we, uh, we've already talked on the phone a couple of times, but I hope that uh, one of these days we get to meet in person. Thank you. And I'm not trying to, and uh, uh, Punjabi Bolde, Hindi Bolde, I know you've been, you, you were born here, so your, your English is. Uh, 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 Amar, to be clear, Punjabi te Hindi de hat mera thoja tang hega, but I'll, I'll do my best. But, uh, but yes, absolutely. I think for sure we're going to be discussing and talking and conversing in three different languages. Your Punjabi and Hindi is better than my English, I can tell you that, but you know, uh, that's wonderful. We will touch upon the immigration section regulations where it doesn't require Punjabi Hindi at all. So we'll go from there. So the 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 topic of today's discussion, Raj, is, is, uh, is for the past about two years or so, uh, there's a great uh, avalanche of applications on spousal work permit. You know, spousal work permit is open work permit based on some student who is a full-time student here in India, or some from India in Canada, and they are sponsoring their husband or wife from, from Punjab, from, from anywhere in India. So they do those applications, and this is called an international mobility program, and now's the time, so I can 
share on the screen what I'm talking about. So some people who do not know, they will not know. So this is a program by IRCC. Uh, you can see on the screen, this is called International Mobility Program. And uh, spouses of, uh, oh my God, let me see, did I click it somewhere else? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, you, yeah, you've got it. It's the, it's the uh, public it's, policy. Yep. It's, yeah, the, it's the public policy. I'm sorry, it didn't, it didn't load up. So uh, if, if somebody is a, uh, so spouses of skilled workers, spouses of full-time students, they can apply for a, for a work permit for their spouse there. So uh, especially for cases uh, which are from Punjab, especially which are like love marriages or inter-caste marriages or so-called secret marriages, uh, people, people they, they tend not to marry in Punjab where the domicile is. They will run away to places like Delhi and Ghazibad and other places where they can get this a marriage done quickly and uh, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, secretly where, where none of the family's members are, are required to be invited because of threat of maybe disclosure. And when they apply for spouse work permit in the Canadian High Commission interview, the interviewing officer have routinely uh, scoffed at the marriage certificate which are issued outside their Punjab domicile. For example, if they married in Ghaziabad and Delhi or something, and they wonder, hey, why did you marry in Delhi? Why did you not marry in Punjab? Even though it, it's an open declared fact that you know this is a secret marriage. And uh, the visa officers for the past about two years or so, they have declined uh, this, this application. They have closed down, clamped down on this kind of application saying that since you married outside Punjab and you married in something called a RS Samaj Mandir or Ghazibad, which I know you will talk about later, uh, that your marriage is not genuine, that's why I am denying your application. Not only I'm denying, but I will also, based upon this uh, illegal marriage, I'm also going to, uh, you know, make you inadmissible for five years under Section 40. So this is the background of the challenges that I am facing. I am, you know, s uh, till last year because of COVID. Now it's everything stopped, but. Many of the times in the PFL letter, you know, the procedural fairness letter, when we try to explain that this is a genuine marriage and this is not as, uh, you know, as, you know, as, as suspicious as you think, they have, they have not, uh, they, they have not agreed with us. And so they had to be transferred to federal court. And I know you were getting some inquiries also, uh, you know, last year or perhaps even earlier, and you have a case now to discuss with us what happened in this in this kind of, uh, you know, uh, procedure fairness letter and what was the strategy and the success that you achieved, uh, you know, recently about a case pertaining to Ghaziabad. The, I'm sorry, your audio is, audio is not, your, your audio, something happened to your audio. You can hear me? Uh, you, you, cannot, you cannot hear me at all? Uh, yes, no. Yeah, yeah, it's better. I can, your, your volume may have gone down. I think I can hear you a little bit. All right. Yeah, uh, it's good. Is this yeah. better? Yeah, this is much better, but yeah. Amarjo, thank you for the introduction. Um, you know, for the Punjabis that are, might be listening to this uh, uh, broadcast, obviously we'll, we'll flip in and out. Yeah. Uh, I understand, obviously, you have many, many subscribers, not all Punjabis, but Indians do tend to drive the litigation at federal court. So the very first... Very first, if we talk about the first case in terms of Immigration Refugee Board is Singh. Singh, yeah. <laughs> Singh is from 1985, right? Yeah. So if you look at the case law, it's going to be Singh and it's going to be it's going to be Punjabis and it's going to be Tamils. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the Punjabis and Tamils dominate immigration litigation. Yeah. Um, in terms of our involvement in this area is that. India is the largest, or Delhi is the largest visa processing office outside of Canada. Yeah. And so you have massive numbers of applications. Now, what, what you have here, and this is a great, there's a, 
the the book that I I taught I taught at the University of Calgary the immigration uh, refugee law uh, course at the Faculty of Law in the University of Calgary is I used Vic Satchewich, which is points of entry. Yeah. You have to understand different e visa officers and different visa offices have different attitudes. Yeah. Delhi is enforcement minded. So Delhi, Changi Pale applications, Delhi will refuse. Changi yeah. Pale. Like, we're talking about first marriages, two 25-year-olds getting married, being sponsored to Canada. Delhi will refuse an application like this on some sort of bahana, on yeah. some, on some sort of uh, nonsense. And so what we saw, which was very concerning to me, was that we had girls that would come here to Canada, typically girls. Typically girls would come here to Canada they would be, they were, as international students, the husbands would apply for that open work permit, that spousal open work permit application. Mm. And what we were seeing out of Delhi is applications being denied, not just, I'm not satisfied, section 40, misrepresentation, you are lying, it's a five-year ban. Now, here's the problem. The consultants, the so-called consultants, ghost consultants, whatever, out of India, they would do this application, it was refused on Section 40. It's a five-year ban. But they're like, oh, you can just apply again. Now, in reality, you can't just apply again because it's a five-year ban. A five-year ban is a five-year ban. Yeah. And so what we've now done 15, 20 applications because that five-year ban for the husband in India is going to result in inadmissibility, ineligibility for the permanent residence of the spouse in Canada. And so yeah. Delhi was taking this, they were conflating two issues. I'm not satisfied that your marriage is genuine versus that you are lying to me. And so we ended up running, you know, we, we ran 15 cases to the federal court. Luckily, most of those cases were consented to by the Department of Justice. This most recent case that you're referring uh, to, sir, uh, Gurpreet saying, ended up as a reported decision, which which blew my mind because I was going to win. Uh, I was clearly going to win this case, but the Department of Justice uh, lawyer wanted to run this anyway, I guess. And so this is the problem. And so a lot of these people don't know that misrepresentation or ban is for five years. You you can't apply again and you must you must go to the federal court on yeah. this sort of finding because it will kill your permanent residence application um, in Canada. Yeah, that's, that's, that's uh, you know, you touched upon uh, so-called consultants in India, and I, I'm, I'm willing to, if I may, uh, if I may be that uh, audacious to even say there are some consultants even in Canada uh, who do not know or do not appreciate the gravity of misrepresentation, and they are quite lax in how they present documentation and information in any application, any TRV application, whether it's study permit, work permit, or just regular TRV for parents and stuff. I'll just give you one, one small example, and that will tell you uh, how, and I know you have, you have given some lectures and you have a certain opinion about uh, regulated consultants in Canada versus lawyers here. Uh, just some, to be, hold on, yes. hold on. If yes. I can interrupt. Yes because of that yeah. last comment. Just to be clear, yeah. I went and testified before Parliament. Yes, I know. And my opinion is very different than the Canadian Bar Association. Correct. And they, don't, they do not like my opinion. I know, I know, I saw that, I saw that. Just, but, just, just no, to be no, that's, clear. That's fine. We, will, we will not mix that sentiment in this year, but I can... No, just to be clear, I am very, very supportive of immigration consultants, regulated immigration consultants Correct. in Canada. I've, I'm supportive of them. Obviously, the CBA thinks um, otherwise. Uh, obviously, both of us are opposed to ghost, so-called ghost consultants Correct. who are not regulated, who uh, do not adhere to any degree of, uh, of, uh, of professional responsibility. Yes, yes. So, so I, I'll give you just one, one or two examples, whether they, these consultants or visa specialists, whether they are in India or in Canada, 
uh, when they fill up those application forms, like, like when you fill the, the IMM0008 or background declaration or 1295, 1294, on the third last page, they always ask you, sir, please tell us, have you ever been refused for Canada or any other country or refused for visa for Canada or any other country or refused admission to any other country? Well, this is a very... It looks like it's a very innocuous uh, question. It's harmless. It's, it's, oh, who cares? We don't remember something. So somebody, some consultant would say, Oh, Paji, what do you want to do? You were in Australia, you refused to go six years ago. Oh, what do you know what to do? What do you want to do? Let's just continue. Just continue. And on top of that, as far, you know, just to uh, confidence building, you started the passport, you expired, and the passport was lost. What do you want to do? We are not going to, you know, there's no need to tell him. Not to, not to, uh, you know, not, not to be afraid of what will happen upon disclosure. Uh, they, many people don't know, and many consultants also. I, I'm, I'm not willing to go that far. Some lawyers, perhaps, even don't even know that under the five key, five, uh, what is it called? Five secret I, five eyes, five. So five, five secret eyes. You know, all these immigration databases are interconnected, and they can always do a non-reportable trace, and they can find out. And you know, without without any without any you know fear of punishment, they they and, and they they will they will routinely advise people to write whatever they can and and, and they will go. So that's one example. One this is one egregious example of of you know violation of ERPA to cause misrep later on. Second example is when people fill up the application forms, they they are quite non-serious about their background history, like employment history, the address history. They don't care. You know, some people say, Paji, dasso, ji, ki show kar diye? Ka, where are you working? Nahi ji, tusi dasso, tusi kaoge, te apna idhar letter bana lage. That means we will create a job, a job profile to fill up the gap of a study visa application. So they don't care about whether this background information is relevant to the decision which the visa officer will make. And immigration consultants, and you know, when we say immigration consultant, we say any consultant, not like RCIC. Any consultants, they will, they, they, they don't care, they, you know, because they have made the money, they, they charge a little bit, they get commission from the college and say, you know, who cares? If you get the visa, that's fine. We got another client. We got a total population waiting. So, misrepresentation is taken very non-seriously until the until the time nothing is happening, and you know, they are they are. The visa officers thinking about they say hey nothing as soon as they get the PFL letter and now and now you know they are they are they are taking it back so in the case where where the spouse visa cases the case which which I just showed you I will show it again on the screen this case is uh, is a typical case of a out of Punjab marriage in Ghaziabad and they and this is a this is a temple complex in Kavinagar in Ghaziabad and, and and anybody who's interested they can go to online and type on Google, and they will see several references on Times of India uh, report showing what what was going on in the years of 2016 and 2018 in the in the temple industry complex in Ghazi. But several advocates in like the the lawyers in India were connected with this with this industry, and uh, some some people who came to me they and I asked them you know who got this marriage arranged and say some guy called marriage consultant marriage consultant marriage advisor in Punjab. He he took us to the Ghaziabad and he says we'll get everything done. And believe it or not, you know they took that overnight train. In the morning they they reached to Ghaziabad. Within within about three to four hours they were they were married. They got the marriage certificate and off they go in the afternoon for a for a quick honeymoon. And the girl is back in Canada the next day. This was the type of marriages they were they were producing for spouse visa. So what what happened? Can you share us what happened in your case? Is the story similar to my, this or? Or something else happened in the Ghaziabad case that you handled? Well, I would, what I would do is I would characterize that finding of misrepresentation in the broader context of refusals out of Delhi. Yeah. So Delhi is, is waiting. They're ready and waiting. They're enforcement minded. There's a number of different officers that have, I think, polluted and contaminated the other officers. And these are originally uh, locally engaged officers. These were originally locally engaged officers from many, many years ago. And in fact, I've even cross-examined some of these officers. Um, and the problem is, is that the GCMS notes that we get don't really reflect the contamination because the contamination is literally done on, 
post-it notes. Yeah. yeah. So the contamination is done on post-it notes, which is when they dig, when they don't dig. None yeah. of that stuff ever shows up in the GCMS notes. Now, we can, we can glean when they dig, when they don't dig. So, girl comes to Canada. Typically, it's a girl. Higher eyelet scores. She gets a study permit, and that marriage that she has with the husband takes place within a very short time of the grant of the study permit. Yeah. or her arrival to Canada, or she goes back and gets married. So just a, the marriage is very much within a certain period of time of the study permit. or st uh, And so Canada is aware of, let's call them islets brides. Yeah. So this, yeah. Is, this is what happened in Australia. This is what happened in New Zealand. And so they're very, very cognizant. Is this just the girl comes to Canada, she gets no. married, the guy's side pays for her education, what have you. So there was various applications or various refusals that we dealt with prior to this, which was, okay, there's this sort of very, very quick wedding with very few guests, and the Punjabi guys, I don't know what problem Punjabi guys have, they do terrible interviews. They have no idea what their wife is doing in Canada. They have no idea what their wife is studying in Canada. Obviously, there's a quick wedding. Um, and the answers really don't really make sense. So there was any number of this islets brides, typical scenario where the husband didn't know a lot. And it was a quick wedding. And it was a um, sparsely attended wedding. And they're like, I'm not satisfied. Uh, but I think you're lying to me. And so it was a refusal on misrepresentation. So those are the first cases that I dealt with. So yeah. I did about like eight, 10 of these cases, which is like, you can't conflate insufficiency of wedding of the marriage, which is like, I'm not satisfied with your lie. So that was the first iteration of my cases at federal court. And we won all of those and we got consents on all of those. Now, remember, immigration and us in litigation, it's it's a cat and mouse game. So yeah. Delhi obviously adapted. Delhi adapted. And so this most recent case, they were ready and waiting. So what we had with the most recent case, Gurpreet Singh, is yes. that the... You know, her wife, her family was opposed to the marriage. She returns. They go to Uttar Pradesh. They go to Ghaziabad. They get married there. And they get married there because her family is opposed to it. And it's sparsely attended. So low key. When the sponsorship goes in, the officer is, well, wait a second. You're sick. You get married in an Arya Samaj wedding. You didn't know about these Hindu purification rituals. And again, obviously the officer knows about these purification rituals. I don't even know about these purification rituals. Yeah. Um, and so we have this so-called expert on this uh, on Arya Samaj weddings. And so the officer says, I have these concerns. So officer sends a procedural fairness letter, the PFL. Sends a PFL, the, cl the clients obviously respond to it, and they respond to it with substantive documents, corroborative documents, probative documents, very, very credible documents. So we have, you know, the marriage certificate signed off by the Ministry of External Affairs of India. We've got a subdivisional magistrate, Amit Bhatnagar, who's signing off on these documents. So... The visa officer is relying on some Times of India articles saying that, you know, some pundit in some of these Arya Samaj uh, mandirs are signing off on weddings that are not legitimate or or don't follow these sort of protocols. So, uh, so we responded to the procedural fairness letter. The next officer just says no. Um, no, they haven't given any documentation that satisfies the concerns. Refusal, Section 40, five-year ban, which of course means uh, ineligibility, inadmissibility for the wife in Canada to apply for permanent residence. I, I have a 
uh, I have an observation here about uh, this kind of uh, refusal. Uh, in the in the past, uh, I, I saw a case about two years ago where a similar marriage, more or less similar background, uh, where they, they use the word that you chose to marry in Ghaziabad. The the rules of marriage registration in Ghaziabad require that one of the applicants must be a domicile in that uh, district, in that village, at least somewhere. Since you, since you did not follow the UP marriage registration rules, you were not eligible to marry in the first place. Mm. Thereby, your marriage itself is not uh, is null and void and is not accepted for us to recognize. Have you heard an argument like this or what, what is your, what is the reaction to argument like this? Yes, that, and uh, I think this is discussed in Gurpreet. Uh, the actual law is uh, domicile of one of the individuals, but also it, UP will take uh, jurisdiction if the marriage is performed within the UP, uh, Uttar Pradesh. So um, yeah, that, you know, the the argument that it's not valid because of domicile obviously would have to then consider whether the state would take jurisdiction if the marriage is performed there. But, but you know, obviously you know, and I, I know this, that uh, even though the domicile requires prohibit uh, foreigners, like non-domicile people to just walk in and fly in and get married here, like a, like a, a Vegas style, you know, walk in marriage, uh, the the entire machinery of the pundit himself, you know, sitting in a shanty, you know, like a little fire where people are just walking around fire, and and then ADM assistant, district magistrate, they are all all in cahoots with with the industry of the lawyer giving them bribes to get this thing done quickly, uh, bypassing the requirement of the domicile itself. And this was this was the refusal letter about two years ago. One of my first cases that I, I got. I, 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 look, I can't comment about the refusal letter of a case that I've never dealt with. Sure. But the concept is that visa officers who are either Canadian or obviously not experts in Indian law or domestic law sure. are expounding about the validity of validly issued marriage certificates from that particular country. So if Uttar Pradesh issues a marriage certificate, if that marriage certificate is signed off by the Ministry of External Affairs, it has all the indicia of reliability and authenticity. Can some Canadian, can some visa officer of a different country say, no, this is not valid? Th this was where we found ourselves uh, in Gurpreet Singh. Uh, but they did not necessarily attack validity uh, per se, um, in in your case, in, in your case, they did not. In your case, they did seemed, not. It seemed it, it seemed to be some sort of collateral attack, but it, it was there, but not quite there. Not not quite there. Okay. Uh, one one of the things that you also used, uh, you also mentioned about. Uh, uh, that some section officer of the Ministry of External Affairs also endorsed or put a seal on it. How did you manage that? Did he do it himself or upon your suggestion? No, no, no. I, I mean, look, so Amar Jyot, I, I think uh, we are both in this probably same um, agreement. When you get a procedure of fairness letter from Delhi. This was already done before. This was already done before. Be very careful. You must give a pura, say, mukammal response. And this is, by the way, this is why we won at the federal court. Yeah. If you if you read Justice Zinn's decision, this is why we win because the the response to the procedural fairness letter was beyond question. Yeah. So if you ever get a procedural fairness letter, you or your and it's going to be some ghost consultant or consultant type in India. If you ever get a procedural fairness letter out of Delhi, make sure the response is over the top. And in fact, at that point, if you do get a procedural fairness letter out of India, you may want to seek out probably better representation. That's right. That's that's right. That's right. So uh, what about those? Now, this is this case. I, I all I, I, I tend to uh, put put this case, the Gurpreet case, uh, which which was one recently is, 
in, in at the level of Vavilov case in generally in reasonable term because you know if we are having too many misrep cases on based on intercaste marriage and other cases this this is a this is a trend setting uh, you know like a precedence which will which will change the direction of the future similar cases what what happens now to uh, because there's a 60 uh, day uh, statute limitation of judicial review uh, can this be used for cases that were done uh, older than 60 days or last year or so? Maybe not. Yeah, Amar Jyot, this is tough. So if you, you've read the decision, of course. And so what, what I had is one of my assistants is, uh, is my, my, my primary assistant is Nidhi Sharma. Yeah. And so I had actually put in an affidavit from Nidhi Sharma about all the other cases from Delhi regarding misrepresentation on open work permits. Yeah. And that was struck out. So Justice Zinn didn't like, didn't like it. Federal court is very, very strict. They yeah. want uh, just what was before this individual decision maker. Now, I wanted to show that Delhi is on a frolic of its own. I don't know what Delhi is doing. Delhi is doing weird things. I've been doing immigration for 17 years. Delhi is going off on some crazy tilting at Don Quixote, tilting at windmills level stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. So I said, hey, we've just got eight other consents from basically the same off the same officers, right? The same Initials keep popping up. Everyone knows. Whoever knows anything about this knows it's AP, it's SN, it's these are the initials out of Delhi, right? Like anyone that knows anything knows that these are the initials. So we try to, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to correct what's going on in Delhi. Justice Zinn was very clear when I did the hearing is that if I have a problem with these officers, then I need to do a complaint through whatever, the program manager or whatever avenues I've got, which is not actually that practical, but that's fine. Justice Zinn is, uh, I do re uh, respect Justice Zinn a, a lot. And so Delhi has this problem. They're going to take an ordinary sadaran, normal refusal. They're going to elevate it to section 40, which is going to cause pure headache, siapa, like pure bifta for yeah. this young couple. And I think Delhi is wrong. And I'm hoping that, you know, all of these victories that I've had, and I've, I've not lost, but I'm hoping all of these victories will make them pull back. But I have a feeling that they're actually going to dig in. Uh, they might just adapt. Uh, yeah. So they might just <laughs> adapt and and they might just get stronger refusals against me now that I've done 15, 20 of these things. Yeah, yeah. I think they will be quite uh, alert and uh, aggressive in 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 uh, latching on to something which is uh, unassailable clause in, in uh, you know, so, PFL. So rem remember one thing. If you're doing, an, and, you know, I really respect the, the fact that you try to increase knowledge of, of, of everyone that listened to you, but... What, and uh, perhaps you might agree with me is that you, maybe you don't put that open work permit application in. Don't put the application in. Wait until you've got irrefutable evidence of a genuine level marriage. Because otherwise they'll be like, Dobi ka kutta na ghar ka na gatka, right? Because, <laughs> you know, like he gets refused on misrep, your PR application is refused, so now what? Now you're going to pay Raj Sharma seven to eight thousand dollars for a federal court right maybe you know you get married in november you do the open work permit application in january maybe maybe you don't do it maybe you don't do it yeah how do you how do you i know i know you have uh, described the typical uh, scenario of uh, what they have used is what called hasty marriage where the girl flies in spends about a day marries the next uh, next week spends about one week or so there's no honeymoon, nothing. There's no joint photographs. And, you know, one of those uh, proof of uh, uh, relationship. And immediately they file for the work visa and they get, get declined. Now, uh, what, what they are using is when you apply for a sponsorship through like a Canadian citizen or something, which is meeting the definition of R4, like, a, you know, uh, genuine intent, genuine intent. So they are using that, that 
standard of definition of genuine genuineness of marriage to spouse applications and by by saying few things like for example i've seen thousands of cases like this so it, 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 that's a very intelligent astute observation it pehla kar de sige they were conflating regulation 4 with section 40 yeah. it pehla kar de sige we put a stop 10 we did 10 federal court applications <laughs> they've st- now they're like no 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 we're not conflating regulation 4 with 4 because they would put it in their gcms notes regulation 4 I'm not satisfied therefore section 40. So that was an easy win for us. Yeah. You can't conflate these two sections, regulation 4 versus section 40. So you're exactly right. It pehla kar de sige they've adapted. They're now moved on to this other area of insufficiency or a broader uh, concept of insufficiency. Yeah. If if that is if that is true now if the R4 is is uh, is is stuck, you know, stuck ground now. Uh what just a, just a, as a general question of curiosity if somebody has a legal marriage certificate from wherever uh if they have uh, adequate maybe cohabitation few maybe weeks or months or so why would not that be sufficient enough for them to consider the other party a spouse why would they even say that you are no not a spouse and i i will put a section r205c2 because uh you do not meet the definition of a spouse and routinely most refusal letter will have this kind of statement i'm not sure i'm not sure i i don't know why delhi is using this sort of like hathora to kill a machcha <laughs> I, i i don't know why we're using a hammer to kill a mosquito here i i have no idea kyunki and again amar jo thonu pata loki sade ko le onde a latta kattan to baad bilkul pehla right nahi. people come to us after the injury it's not like i did the Ajay. work permit application because if i did it i'd be like maybe wait until there's another trip yeah. and so this is a hard answer this is a hard question to answer which is like i don't know i don't know but yeah. delhi's taking this psychotic psychotic approach to this and so number one obviously this is before they talk to guys like me and you Yeah. Right? Like yeah. Be- because if it was me and you, we'd be like you just got married to this guy 2 weeks ago? Yeah. Maybe just wait. Yeah. Right? And I, so I will just right? And so they come to us after some sort of PFL or a refusal. And then our options are very much limited. Very much limited. So this is tough. I don't know how to change the culture in Delhi. I the only thing I know is federal court. and and i've done 15 20 of these things and you know uh rabda shukra that uh, we we've, we've had some success here but very very harsh consequences and and you know this you know this people delhi is refusing you know you have three refusals of a us visa they only disclose two out of the three and all of a sudden delhi is talking about a misrep delhi is um you know this uh you know like aag ki darya like this is a, very dangerous to even try so sometimes you don't try right sometimes you just hold back until you're ready because delhi is dangerous okay it's very very khatarnak visa office let me let me ask you let me ask you from your from your perspective on on section 40 if somebody actually uh, generally for, forgets to mention that he was refused one time in australia yeah. out of Yeah. and he has mentioned twice for yeah. two times canada refusal but he forgot maybe australia is not uh, relevant and if if he, if they are issued a pfl what what do you how how will you attack this as a jr amar jo the the case law is not great yes, um sir. i'm i've been asked to write a book on uh, inadmissibility so i just finished the chapter on misrepresentation um their own manuals talk about typographical errors their own manuals talk about uh you know um in inadvertent inadvertent inadvertency their own manuals talk about like human sort of fri- uh, fragility yeah. um it's it's 
it's tough because again, by the time it gets to a PFL or by the time it gets to a refusal, then they contact us and then we run the federal court and then the federal court case law is not great. I mean, other than I've got two or three decent case law from Justice Zinn and Justice Barnes, but uh, even I have trouble here. Yeah, uh, you, you are right, actually. I acknowledge, uh, you know, uh, frustration in, in dealing with this kind of, you know, forgetfulness of your previous refusal of travel history. And then uh, all the cases that I've seen, you know, judge, judges have not uh, uh, sympathized with, with the applicants. You know, you know you, you, it's your, it seems like your intention was to hide something, and that's why it is. So that is not going to, that not going to be helpful at all for GR. Uh, uh, so today's takeaway is that I think... Uh, if, if somebody has a legal marriage certificate from no matter what, what domain, and if he has sufficiently, uh, uh, you know, and clearly explained the reason why, why this was done, why the family was not invited, and, you know, those things and something, I think uh, Section 40 can be, can be thwarted very successfully. Okay. It depends on the officer, I think. I think yeah. uh, if you've got that sort of bad luck, it depends on the visa office, depends on the visa officer. So some visa officers and visa offices are more comfortable with the Section 40, notwithstanding Justice Diner's comments in Toki, notwithstanding Justice Zinn's endorsements of Justice Diner's comments in Toki in Gurpreet Singh. So hopefully it, it, there... It, there is some case law that is from the federal court that's pushing back on Delhi's uh, Najai's uh, refusals on Section 40. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I've got uh, I've got what I. Those are jagar to see agar to adabi koi agar misrepresentation case agar is tarah di koi thano koi letter mil rahi hai ya mil chuki hai ya to see soch rahe ho especially je 60 days tak arikul hai time. I'll try to put his name and uh, phone number at the bottom of the video so that he can be independently. He don't have to contact me. You can independently contact him. Otherwise, the both is Siddha Kamer, Raj Sharma, R-A-J, Raj Sharma, to see Raj Sharma lawyer. Google the Pakit Dehlena, you will uh, land at his website or at many of his links to cases or maybe his speeches he has, he has uh, given, and especially he gives other uh, interviews to radios uh, and other TV shows as well. So thank I'm you. Just, uh, you know, I think you're doing a great job, and uh, I'm I'm a fan of your uh, yours as well. And I hope that I get to uh, have the uh, opportunity to see you in person one of these days. I, I go to Edmonton quite regularly, and I uh, can't wait to see you and meet you. And uh, I think you're doing a great job. We will we will butt heads together as soon as you are in Edmonton. Give me a shout, and then we will talk, and then we will uh, exchange our notes about something that I have other things uh, in my mind. But I, I guess we are short on time today, and I just wanted to stay on focus on the misrep itself. But I have many more issues to discuss, and especially you know entry to Canada and uh, what happens at the border and stuff. But maybe for some other time and some other occasion. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sharma. I know, hope to uh, see you, and you're doing a great job. I, I always, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I like to read cases uh, on Canley a lot about immigration cases. And uh, I was for the past about seven to eight months, I was searching for somebody who was uh, somebody who was, who was zealous about fighting, uh, you know, misrepresentations. And I guess I've I found one in you and you you appreciate and you you have you have a thing and you have a feeling about what was going on in Derry which many other Canadian lawyers, you know, maybe they don't understand that much about the culture in Delhi. So you do. And I'm, I'm if you if you ever come down to Calgary, I know you're from Delhi. If you ever come down to Calgary, uh, make sure you uh, you spend some time with me. I actually uh, I imported a 1971 Hindustan ambassador. Oh, from- my God. <laughs> How do you? And- how did you bring the ambassador uh, to Calgary? I mean, uh, when you have some fondness about that old old bunker, like you know, that used to be a, a government vehicle for long, long yeah, years. Yeah, so it's 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 white. It's got curtains in the back, and oh. uh, yeah, I've got uh, I've got the driver's uniform. We're gonna have some Gora. We're gonna have some Gora drive us around uh, <laughs> in, in the 1971 ambassador. Oh man! Um, so You're... yeah, I mean, it's it's fully restored to 1971 standards. Wow. So I, I, whenever you come, uh, we're going to spend some time together. And then maybe our next video will be from the ambassador. 
uh, although it's very loud that diesel that that engine is a little bit loud but uh, my we'll my definitely suspicion, hang out my suspicion is that you or somebody in your family has had some kind of uh, clinging to bureaucracy in that time where you know the all, all officials used to drive in ambassadors going to the government offices with the sirens sometimes on the top i, I, I have the lal batti i do have the lal batti <laughs> as well oh wow i i i i need to come to calgary i mean i i i bypass calgary sometimes going to bam but i i need yeah. to stop in calgary now next, of course next next time you're in calgary i'll be naraz if i'll be naraz if we don't hang out so Make sure next time you're in Calgary, we're going to hang out and we're going to go out around in the uh, Hindustan Ambassador. And then uh, and next time I'm in Edmonton, I'm, we're going to meet for sure. It, it has Alberta plates? Uh, it has Alberta plates, but it has the original uh, Indian plates as well. Indian DLY or something? Uh, it, it's uh, RJ. It's uh, uh, from Rajasthan. It, 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 Sharma ji, Sharma ji, thank you very much. I, 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 I feel uh, privileged to talk to you and you know pick yeah. your brain about misrep and uh, I, I enjoy talking to you and I and I hope to uh, discuss uh, further immigration topics in in the time stream. The honor was mine, sir. I really enjoyed hanging out with you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Take care.